last ten years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? So bottom line is, uh, you're all going to die. <laughs> and probably not too many in this room will be alive even 600 months from now, no matter what you do. There's been 109 billion humans, modern humans, born on the planet. There's about 7.5 or so billion alive today. We have well-documented evidence that exactly five people have lived past 117. So your odds of living past 117 currently are about 1 in 20 billion. So if you're a betting person, the odds are much better that you're going to die before that. And that's assuming you do everything right. <clears throat> so the question isn't, are you going to live forever? We kind of already know that's not going to happen. The question is, how well are you going to live in the time that you have left? Now, if the key to health was the amount of money that we spent on health care, then we should be the healthiest people on the planet because we spend two and a half times more per person per year than anybody anywhere else. And so you would think, therefore, if money correlated with health, that we would be living longer and living better. In other words, our life expectancy would be higher. And our healthy life expectancy, that is the number of years that you're actually fully functional, would be higher. But it's not. If we look at the data, we're not living longer, and we're certainly not living better than people that are spending dramatically less money, which means maybe we're not spending the money on exactly the right thing. So the average person in the United States will have 9.4 years of debility, almost two decades of poor health. And it's this that we're most likely to impact through healthful living habits. Not living forever, but living fully until you die. Not finding yourself unable to talk or move, lying in some nursing home bed, waiting for people to come and change your diaper, but rather maintaining a high degree of functional vitality right up until hopefully one night you go to sleep and you don't wake up because you've reached your life attention. What we're spending our money on is the leading cause of death. We're spending our money treating heart disease, cancer, stroke, and related conditions. But perhaps what we should be focusing on is the actual causes of disease. Not the leading causes of death, but the actual causes of death. The reason people get heart disease, cancer, and stroke, and that includes the use of tobacco, alcohol, and poor dietary choices. If you look at this list of ultimate cause of death, you notice tobacco kind of leads the list. And you know, we all know tobacco is a fabulously effective tool for causing premature death and disability, in part because it affects almost every organ system of the body. Interesting, they tell you that 80% of smokers will never get lung cancer. How dangerous can it really be? But they don't tell you it's because people die from heart disease before they live long enough to grow their tumors. I always thought that an enterprising cigarette manufacturing company could figure out how to make their cigarettes even more toxic so everybody died of heart disease, and then they could advertise it as being cancer safe. <laughs> Elevations of blood pressure are now ubiquitous. If you're 65 or older and you do not have high blood pressure or hypertension, you're abnormal. So the average person, the majority of people that reach 65, will have high blood pressure. And as you can see, according to the Center for Disease Control, it's a major contributing cause of death. 
alcohol consumption. If you read the newspapers, you think alcohol is some kind of health food. If you don't drink, you should start. It's good for your heart, right? It's got powerful antioxidants, like red wine's got resteratrol in it. Is that true? Sure. And where does the resteratrol in red wine come from? So you could eat the skin of grapes. Is it also true that tell you, oh, well, alcohol, it thins your blood and reduce your, reduce your risk of dying from a clotting stroke. Is that true? Sure. It works much like aspirin does. It has a blood thinning effect. Now, it doesn't reduce your all-cause mortality. You're still just as likely to die. But instead of dying from a clotting stroke, you die from a bleeding stroke because it increases the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So it's important that you die from a bleeding stroke rather than a clotting stroke and alcohol problems should be part of the routine. <laughs> Being overweight, another list here, low fruit and vegetable intakes, independent of these other variables, just not eating enough fruits and vegetables is a major contributing ultimate cause of death. Physical inactivity, illicit drugs, and unsafe sexual behaviors. You know, none of these are conditions of excess, are they? These are all conditions, or excuse me, none of these are conditions of deficiency. These are all conditions of excess. Uh, it used to be they called these conditions the diseases of king disease of dietary excess, but now they've become ubiquitous. Metabolic syndrome. Almost all the people that you know in the real world will be manifesting some version of this. Abdominal obesity, elevated lipids, blood pressure, blood cholesterol. This is what's killing everybody. And we know that we are, in fact, getting bigger and fatter by the day. In 1986, just shortly after I started practice, there wasn't a single state in the United States that had more than 14 percent obesity saturation. Um, but within 10 years, everybody had, and they even had to come up with a new color because <laughs> they got to 20 percent. So one in five people in some of these states had achieved the exalted state of obesity. They were at least 30 pounds overweight on a five foot four inch frame, or BMI greater than 30. Obesity, for some reason, began to spread epidemically throughout the United States within just a few years. And in 2001, we got another new color. Here in the home of deep fried ice cream, they managed, after tremendous work, to reach 25% obesity saturation. So one in four had achieved obesity. Not to be outdone, a few years later, obesity at that level had spread throughout the southeast United States. And then we got another new color in 2005, which we managed to get to 30%. And then a few years later, that had spread, and then we finally got absolute proof that the folks at the Center for Disease Control were truly optimists. And the reason I can say that is although nobody had actually achieved 35% obesity saturation, the Center for Disease Control folks were so confident in the American people that they put it on the legend. And sure enough, they were proven correct just one year later when 35% obesity saturation had been achieved, both in Mississippi and West Virginia. And obesity has continued to spread every year uh, since then. It's not just in the United States, it's also worldwide. Now more people are sick and dying and suffering as a consequence of dietary excess than deficiency. But I'm proud to say as an American that when it comes to winning this contest of trying to achieve the most obese saturation possible, we're number one. <laughs> We've done a better job than anybody else in the world at achieving obesity and increasing our strategic fat reserves. And in fact, if you compare us to some of these Asian countries here at the end of the list, they only have 3% obesity saturation. It's almost like they're not even trying. <laughs> now, we're not just getting fatter, we're also getting sicker. And conditions directly associated with uh, Obesity are things like diabetes. You'll notice the obesity uh, incidence has also increased uh, tremendously. In fact, if you compare the correlation coefficient between obesity increase and diabetes increase, there's a one to one correlation. It's almost as if there's some type of connection. <laughs> so, what we're doing about it as a society is telling people they should eat health food olive oil, red wine, dark chocolate, coffee, coconut, anything, diet sodas, fish chicken, dairy products, the dead Dr. Atkins diet. Now that's the, that's the thing we're telling you. And I have to say, he was not a hypocrite. He stuck to that diet of his strictly till the day he died. 268 pounds from cardiac monopoly, but anyway. So what I'm suggesting perhaps we need to do is go after more healthy food. So fruits and vegetables, 
grains and beans, nuts and seeds, a whole plant food, SOS free diet. SOS, as you know, is the international symbol of danger. <laughs> and it also stands for salt, oil, and sugar. The chemicals that we add to food that fool the satiety mechanisms in our brain and lead us to the obesity epidemic that we've just witnessed. In the world of our ancient ancestors, humans had a great deal of difficulty surviving because they lived in an environment of scarcity. Most humans did not live to reproduce. The majority of humans born did not live to reproduce, which means they did not pass on their genes, which means they were not your relatives. They were the losers. <laughs> the winners were the few that got enough to eat, didn't get eaten, and lived to reproduce, passed on their DNA, and those were your relatives. If your parents had not survived, you would not be here, would you? If your grandparents had not survived, your parents wouldn't be here, which means you wouldn't have been here. If your great, 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 great grandparents, if any one of that chain of relatives had not survived, just one, you could not be here. So you are the end result, the piece de resistance of a long chain of successful survival, and you carry in your brains the genes, the DNA, the brain capacity of your ancient ancestors. Humans have been fabulously innovative. We've been using tools for a million years. We've been using heat to process our food, provide light, heat, and protection for five, six hundred thousand years, maybe longer. And about a hundred thousand years ago, um, we began to use the sophisticated use of language, which has turned out to be perhaps the most powerful tool the planet's ever seen. It, allo it allowed us to accumulate and pass on information in a geometric fashion. So something that somebody could learn in a few moments could be passed on without having to spend an entire lifetime of trial and error to master those uh, capacities. And of course, it shows up uh, over our timeline here. You notice that humans over time got bigger, our bodies got bigger, our brains got bigger, up till modern humans around 100,000 years ago. Basically, that's not enough biological time, 100,000 years, for us to see very much change. So presumably today, your brain is essentially the same brain that might, would have been in a modern human about 100,000 years ago. Now, that's important to realize because that means that if you could take, for example, a child from today back 100,000 years ago, they would raise that child just like their own. They wouldn't be able to tell the difference. If you took a child from 100,000 years ago, brought it to today, you would raise that child, you would not be able to tell the difference. Because what makes the difference the brain, and that bit of biological time hasn't substantially changed. So that child from 100,000 years ago, if you raised it, it would be just as annoying when it was a child, just as obnoxious when it reached its teenage years. It would be essentially the same. So the point is, your brain is the brain of a human being that was designed to live in an environment of scarcity. That's the brain you carry. But you don't live in that environment because we changed that environment. That's the kind of food you might have eaten in an environment of scarcity. But now you live in this environment, and in this environment our food is often processed in places that look like this, and often the diet looks something like that. And the, and the profound consequence of these dietary changes uh, is the reason why we have an epidemic of obesity and diseases of dietary excess. The way it works is the brain gets the body to engage in certain behaviors. Behaviors that favor survival and reproduction favor survival and reproduction in an environment of scarcity, in the environment that we were designed for. And the way the brain does that is largely neurochemical. The brain secretes materials like dopamine. Dopamine is the neurochemical that's associated with pleasure. So the more dopamine, the more pleasure. The more dopamine, the more intense the pleasure. So it turns out in a natural setting, there's only two behaviors critical for survival and reproduction. So it's not surprising that those are the two behaviors associated with the natural concentrated exposure to dopamine. What are the two behaviors that people have to engage in in order to get enough to eat and reproduce? That's right, food and sex. Food and sex. <laughs> food and sex are the only natural concentrated stimulants of dopamine for people. Unless you happen to be a male human, then it's entirely different. <laughs> but regardless of whether it's food and sex or sex and food, these normal natural stimulants of dopamine work really well to encourage us to engage in behavior that favors survival and reproduction. What if you didn't enjoy eating? Do you think you'd always remember to do it? All that hunting and chopping and shopping and growing and 
processing? No, you might not. And certainly, what about sex? Do you think people would do all that puffing and puffing and sweating if there wasn't some kind of reinforcement? I don't think so. So this system of reinforcing behaviors in favor of survival and reproduction work well. That's how we survive as a species. And it's true for all the other animals who share the planet with too, by the way. It's not just humans. But humans, unlike many of our other creatures, tended to be a little more creative, a little bit more innovative, and we figured out there was a way to short circuit the system to stimulate dopamine production without actually engaging in normal feeding or sexual behavior. We figured out there were certain chemicals that could artificially trigger this mechanism. We've gone to inordinate effort to find each and every one of them. It's not just alcohol, it seems like methamphetamines, there's materials you can inject in your, in, your, in your veins. There's material like this. What is it? Not sugar, not cheese. That's casomorphine, that's a little different. This is crack cocaine. Were any of you people born? <laughs> cocaine is a very powerful artificial stimulant of dopamine uh, production. In fact, it's such a powerful stimulant of dopamine production, if you quantify how much dopamine is secreted in the brain of a human if they smoke cocaine, and you compare it to how much dopamine is secreted if they have an orgasm during sexual behavior, it turns out there's 10 times more dopamine secreted utilizing cocaine than having sex. So some years ago, I was in Los Angeles, and I presented this information to an older woman, probably in her mid-80s, maybe older. She stood up and she said, excuse me, Dr. Goldhammer, where do I get cocaine? <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> now, if that was the end of the story, we could just say, look, Drugs are bad, just say no, and you know, we'd be done with it. But it's not, because it turns out there's chemicals that could be added to feed, for example, that will artificially stimulate dopamine production um, in animals. For example, if you take a rat or a mouse, either one or two, and you give them algorithm eating, they get to a certain size. But you give these chemicals in the feed of the rat, they'll increase their weight 49% in just 60 days. Now, are the rats getting fat for psychological reasons? Did mommy rat not love them enough? <laughs> Did daddy rat love them too much? Did they have stress from having to get up in the morning? Or is it biological reasons? The artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain led to systematic overeating so they developed obesity and, not, a, not surprisingly, the disease of dietary acids. It works in birds, it works in any animal. You put these chemicals in the food and they systematically overeat. What are the chemicals? You all recognize this? C6H1206. Yeah. This doesn't exist in, in concentrated form in nature. You have to go to a lot of houses to manufacture this. And we've done such a good job of making this um, cost effective by subsidizing it, thanks to our well meaning but misguided government, that people's consumption of sugars now increases to close to 150 pounds a year per person. Now, I don't eat any of it, which means somebody's eating my share too. <laughs> and one particularly noxious version of the high fructose corn syrup, which is processed in the liver much like alcohol, leads to fatty liver infiltrates, cirrhosis, et cetera. Um, we've increased its use a thousand percent since 1986 when it was introduced. Just coincidence that that also correlates with the increase in obesity that we were looking at, I'm sure. What's another chemical you can add to the feed of animals or humans? This is the formula. You, you've seen this formula before. Yeah, that's oil. Including olive oil, and coconut oil, and every other oil. Nine calorie per gram, highly fractionated process. And what's even worse about oil is we take it and we heat it to high temperature. And then we use it to get soaked into some otherwise healthy food like potato. We call it French fries and potato chips and fried foods. I tell patients, listen, Instead of eating those fried foods, just find the deep fryer. Stick your head in it and suck. Because that's what you're doing when you're eating fried foods, and we're seeing the consequence of it in our people. You've got epidemic obesity and diabetes incidents in children now. It's to the point now where 93% of all the calories consumed by people in industrialized countries come from either animal foods, which is meat, fish, fallies, and dairy products, or highly processed pleasure trap chemicals, salt, oil. Sure. Now there's seven percent fruits and vegetables, and I know natural hygienists are often optimists. So you look at that and you say, "Well, wait, still seven percent." There's hope. 
let's keep hope alive, of that 7%, one third of it is one vegetable called potatoes, served almost exclusively as french fries and potato chips. Fruits and vegetables no longer make a statistically significant percentage of the diet of people living in industrialized countries. They are the decoration on the plate. It's called the pleasure trap. It's the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. It's the reason why people are fat, sick, and miserable. There's no mystery. We know why it's the pleasure trap. It's this artificial stimulation of dopamine that happens in your brain. And if you haven't read The Pleasure Trap, you should. The way it works with food is pretty simple. It's based on caloric density. The higher the caloric density, the more the dopamine production is. Why would that be? Why would we be designed, essentially, as energy conserving calorie detection devices? It's because we evolved in an environment of scarcity. Remember, most of the people didn't survive. They didn't get enough to eat. They didn't avoid being eaten. So the few, your ancestors, that did survive were the ones that got enough to eat. And the reason they got enough to eat was because they were exquisitely careful at being able to differentiate valuable foods, that is high in caloric density, and less valuable foods, lower in caloric density. For example, salad, 100 calories a pound. How many pounds, uh, calories do people need? About 2,000 calories a day? So how many pounds of salad would you have to eat a day if you were going to live on your salad? 20 pounds a day. Can you eat 20 pounds of salad a day? If you start at 6 a.m. and you don't stop eating till midnight, can you get in 20 pounds of salad? Not even Mark Huberman can eat 20 pounds of salad. And your brain understands that. And so when your brain sees salad, it says, okay, fine. I can eat some salad until more concentrated food comes along. But I'm not getting excited about it. Because your brain's not stupid. And so if your ancestors would only want to eat salad, they wouldn't have made it. The salad eaters, they bit the dust. Fruit, on the other hand, has 300 calories a pound, three times the caloric density. Why does fruit taste better to us than salad? It's sweet, which therefore it results in more dopamine production. Absolutely, because your brain says, oh, I have to eat 20 pounds of salad, but I only need seven pounds of fruit. Now, it's still a full-time job, but at least you could do it. It's at least mechanically possible. And so fruit is going to be perceived as more valuable. And if you're hungry, you're going to actually want to go to more concentrated foods like potatoes, rice, and beans. Potatoes, rice, and beans have 500 calories per pound. And so your brain's going to naturally want to go to those first because, again, your brain is only concerned to get enough to eat, to push everybody else out of the way and make sure that you survive. And so when it comes to more concentrated foods like that, there's a natural uh, desire for those because you only need about four pounds of food brains, beans, uh, the day, and we we'll don't get enough to eat. What if we invented a food, now granted, this doesn't exist in nature, but what if we invented a food that had 1,200 calories a pound? Do you suggest that people probably would like it? And if you introduce this food at the World's Fair, say in the 1800s, people would line up to get all excited about it? And what if we called the food, I don't know, ice cream? <laughs> ice cream doesn't exist in nature. You've never slipped on that ice cream. <laughs> Uh, in nature. Um, if you melt ice cream down to room temperature and describe it, it's described as sickly sweet. It's so sweet it makes you sick when it's, when it's warm. When it's cold, it tastes so good to people. Why does it taste good when it's cold, but it tastes sickly sweet when it's warm? Did it suck more sugar out of the atmosphere, or was the sugar always there? It was always there, but you didn't know it because you can't detect well sweetness when something's artificially cold. And so as a consequence, to make ice cream taste sweet, you have to super saturate it with sugar. When you warm it up, you can taste what's there. It makes you sick. It makes you just as sick when it's cold, but you just don't know it because you bypassed your normal detection system. What if we invented a food with a higher caloric density than ice cream? Would people like it? This food, let's say it had 1,500 calories a pound, 15 times the caloric density of salad. Do you think people would call it the staff of life? You ever seen this stuff? You take a 500 calorie gram, uh, pound grain like, uh, like a wheat, grind it up into a powder, bake it at high temperatures, and turn it into something that's basically dehydrated, three times the caloric density, 1,500 calories a pound. And that's before somebody turns it into a butter pulp by melting coagulated cow pus all over it, increasing caloric density even higher. This is very appealing. It's appealing because the high caloric density, quick, fast, easy, 
concentrated calories. Have you ever been into a restaurant and they actually put this stuff on the table? They don't even charge for it. They just put a big basket of it. It's all steaming out there. Your brain is going, oh, wow. 1,500 calorie a pound. Give it to me. <laughs> and what happens after time to the bread that's in the basket? What do you notice about it? It's all gone. It's gone. What do you do? Now you push that basket all completely empty to the edge of the table, spread out the napkin so nobody can miss the fact that the bread's all gone, and you wait for the waiter. And you wait, you wait. Finally, the waiter comes around and says, Oh, would you want some more bread? So, of course, first you pretend like you didn't know the thing was empty. Sure, why not? But what you're thinking is, does this guy want a tip or not? <laughs> Do you ever go into the same restaurant and say, excuse me, waiter, I'd like you to bring me three large baked potatoes, because I'd like to eat those before I order my dinner. Can you do that? Why, not? why don't you eat three large baked potatoes before you order your dinner? Because you'd be too full, because the human stomach can only handle about 500 cards of potato. That's about three potatoes, and you kind of mechanically fill the whole thing up. Whereas 500 cards of bread only takes a third of the stuff. So what do you think is going to help you get fat? Pure sugar is 1,800 calories a pound. You can take just about anything you coat it with sugar. <coughs> you ever go into that same restaurant and take 11 of those packets of sugar? And just... <laughs> what? Why not? It's free. It's so cheap that I didn't have to charge for it. What's the problem? You ever had one of those? How many teaspoons of sugar in that? That's, this is the old kind. They don't make these anymore. This is the old. 11 teaspoons of sugar. Now you got the big gulp, the super gulp, the double gulp, the express gulp with free refills, and I swear pretty soon it's going to be a bunch. <laughs> In the future, the leading reason why people are going to hurt their back is they're going to 7 Eleven and get the coke. <laughs> Today, 25% of all the calories consumed by teenagers in this country come from the sugar and soda pop alone. Just the sugar sweet powder. But we don't know why. Our children are getting so fat, and our kids are getting so sick. What tastes better, salad or chocolate? Is that, is that just a cultural thing? Or if we took a thousand people blindfolded, mouthful of salad, mouthful of chocolate, do you think they can tell the difference? <laughs> 2,500 calories a pound. So again, you want to have chocolate, no problem. You just have to change the form you take it and melt it down, rub it all over your belly and hips where it's going to end up. And then when you're done, you wash it off and you don't have to carry it around all week. <laughs> they did a survey of women, not men, just women. They asked women, what would you rather do, have mad, hot, passionate sex or eat chocolate? Two most common responses, what kind of chocolate and how many pieces are we talking about? <laughs> So what are the following conditions that we've talked about have in common? High blood pressure, diabetes, autoimmune disorder, conditions like homophobia. The, the thing about these conditions, if you go to a physician, if you go to a doctor with high blood pressure, what are they going to tell you? Give a pill. They're going to give you a pill or two or three or five, and they will promise you, if you do what you're told, you will never get well. <laughs> they will guarantee you, you will be on these drugs for the rest of your life. You will be sick forever. You will never recover. If you have diabetes, how long do you have to take the drugs? Forever. If you have autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, asthma, eczema, stress, you will never get well, is the promise. There's a better way. And tomorrow, I'll be talking about that. <laughs> and today, whatever time I have left, I'm like,
So you'll hear what's good for you is whatever somebody's trying to sell. So they have to try to get good for you. And like John McDougall says, people love good news about their bad habits. So the fact that something is less bad than something else doesn't make it good. It just yeah. makes it somewhat less bad. So the fact that the dark chocolate may be somewhat less bad than some other type of chocolate doesn't rise it to the level where that's a health point of view. The fact that there's still some food factors left in a food product, whether it's restorable and red wine or some antioxidant in dark chocolate, doesn't mean the overall integrity of that diet um, can be built around those kinds of foods. And so I would argue that those foods have to be avoided. Meat, fish, fat, or bone, salt, and sugar foods have those added to them. Why hasn't the FDA gotten hold of this? Well, that's a very good question. Why hasn't the FDA gotten hold of it? I think that the reality is that there's very powerful industry involved in terms of our food and drug industries that are largely responsible for putting the people that are in power, keeping them in power. And so I think there's tremendous pressures to support the status quo. Sometimes it's also well-meaning misguided people. And probably the biggest problem is that they haven't read the pleasure trap. So if they read the pleasure trap and they spend the four hours it takes to go through it, or now you can listen to the audio version by Chef AJ, if you've done a really good job of going to listen to it in your car instead. Or if you process information like I do better orally than through a written format, if you look at the data, if you look at the facts, if you look at the argument, then I think people would begin to shift their attitude around it. They would still find it difficult to do it because essentially people are addicts. They're addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in their brain, whether it's their alcohol, their coffee, their heroin, or their sugar, oil, and salt. These chemicals all work on this dopamine cascade to obviously varying degrees of intensity. And you know, you don't go up to an alcoholic and say, oh, John, Jane, whatever, your life, you know how it sucks? It's because you're a drunk. And does the alcoholic go, the, it's the alcohol? I had no idea. Oh, thank you. I won't drink anymore. Or do they tell you to mind your own effing business? Yep. I have a question for you because I've never heard your answer. So, um, we read many prominent physicians like Dr. David Katz from Yale two days ago on LinkedIn with a million followers, olive oil accolades. And he separates olive oil from all other processed oils and refined foods. Thursday, a patient brings me from his farm in Sicily, little tin of olive oil right from the tree. You can smell the greenness. I have a restaurant, we have no oil menus, I'm in your camp. It's got to be one of the most common patient questions. I just want to, you know, I want to share what you respond with my yeah, The reality is when you take out a food, you rip it apart, you take out one component, in this case oil, that has, that's the highest concentrated caloric product we've got, nine calories per gram, you remove from it all any mitigating factors like fiber and other things, you end up with a highly processed fraction of food product, which is really good if your goal is to try to get fat and sick. And so the fact that people say, well, all oil is better than something else is another example where it may be somewhat less bad than something else, but that certainly doesn't make it good. We recommend avoiding all oils, all fractionated food products. And you know, now some people say, well, can you get a little bit and not suffer major consequences? It's like asking this though, can somebody have a beer and not become a drunk? Certainly, but if you're a drunk, it's not you. <laughs> okay. So yes, some people can indulge in small quantities of various products and not become overweight or not develop problems. But if you are having those problems, it's not you. Because if you could have controlled it, you would have controlled it. It's not like people aren't trying to control it. They're not able to control it. And so for those people, they should let it go. And other people are saying, you know, it's easier actually to not tease yourself with these drug-like effects than it is to try to regulate them. So it's easier and more productive and more effective to just draw your lines like Dr. Esser was talking about. This is what I do, this is what I don't do. And not have to play this constant battle with yourself as you fight these chemicals that have been carefully designed and foods that have been carefully designed to bang on your neural circuitry. I think there's Cicero said total abstinence. Abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. Which is true. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have questions? Yeah. Yes, we did actually. And I'll be talking about that tomorrow afternoon. Some of our, our research and articles that we've managed to get published. And we've had some tremendous success in the last couple of years. Uh, with the, foundation, the formation of the True Health Foundation, our 501c3 nonprofit research organization, whose mission is education. 
and research. And we've put together a research team. We've been doing some really exciting work. We've got affiliations um, across the country. Uh, most recently, we just had a doctor from the Mayo Clinic, and we've made a formal agreement to move forward with a, a, a study that's going to involve primary prevention of stroke that we'll be doing in conjunction with Mayo. We've got an article actually that's coming out published on this experience at Trinidad Health Center. We have relationships right now with UC Davis, with Washington University. We finished a study with, uh, with uh, Luigi Fontana. We took people before, during, and after long term water fasting. We're looking at a variety of biomarkers. They can measure autophagy, the efficiency of white blood cells, the number of mutations inside the key lymphocytes, which correlates well with aging, cancer incidence, et cetera. So a lot of very sophisticated biomarkers. This will be the first time that this type of work has been done on long-term water only fasting. We've formed a, we have a IRB, a human subjects committee that's got federal-wide assurance, so now we're able to actually get studies authorized uh, with an internal uh, federally chartered uh, human safety committee, which has been a big thing. We've got a, as of Monday, which is what, two days from now, they will finish our BSL-2 lab. We have a sophisticated lab that's been built at the Truma Health Center where we can actually fractionate the blood samples and the tissue samples and stool samples from the vaccine patients and they can then be sent out to various researchers around the country. We're frozen at 86 below, we've got all the separation and fractionation equipment. So that's going to put us in a good position to do this collaborative research. And right now, fasting has become much more of interest. And, and, and again, I'll be talking about this uh, in more detail tomorrow. Are there any conditions that would prevent someone from water fasting? Yes, there's a whole host of uh, contraindications and relative contraindications to fasting. But let me save the fasting-related questions for tomorrow, because I've got, I've got time set up to go through that in a formal way. Well, it's getting better. You know, you have Kaiser. It's interesting. Dr. Lim, who spoke this morning, is intimately involved with Kaiser Permanente in teaching both their doctors and their patients, and they're starting to do more programs. So soon, hopefully, we will have more doctors. We train at the Truman Health Center about 30 doctors a year that come through as a formal part of their education and do internship uh, or rotations, uh, as well as uh, we're at an ND residency site where the doctors can get them. They can't, you can't actually. If they're interested in doing something worthwhile with their life and they'd like to go to companies very well, they can come to the Truman Health Center and learn how to do something useful where they can stop having to tell their patients that they will be sick for the rest of their life. And instead, for those that are highly motivated, they can give them a tool that will actually help them get well. That's the thing that most of our doctors say to us. The most unique part of their experience with us is it's the first time ever they've seen people actually get well. So the question is, what about osteoporosis drugs? Um, there, osteoporosis itself is a condition where we lose the ability to maintain integrity of the bones. Most people would think it's from not taking enough calcium, but we know that taking calcium doesn't have anything to do with dealing with or preventing um, osteoporosis, uh, with the exception of uh, true calcium deficiency dietary issues. The real problem is hormonal balance, the dietary issues, high, pro high animal protein intakes, and lack of weight during exercise. So the important thing with osteoporosis is trying to prevent progression. So we make sure we get the diet right, that it's a low animal protein, not having the high sulfur amino acids, getting mineral rich plant-based foods, get uh, as much resistance exercises as possible so we maintain regular weight bearing exercise, do what's necessary to try to get hormone systems balanced out, most of which is diet and lifestyle stuff. Um, there's not a lot of evidence in most people's cases that the medications that are used do a lot more good than harm. So that specific question is going to be best addressed dealing with one of the medical doctors on our staff where you would talk to them specifically about your unique situation and whether or not the risk reward ratio for you would favor continuing or discontinuing or coming up with some alternative way of trying to regulate those medications. In general though, if there's not like overwhelming evidence that these medications do what you think we want them to do, and there is some evidence that there are some unfortunate side effects, so it's definitely a discussion that needs to be made for the doctor that's not complete idiot. <laughs> 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 I've heard you uh, speak before and say that you don't really eat a lot of spices on your food. You like to just eat it plain and cold. Uh, but I've heard other doctors uh, state the benefits of a lot of different spices. So right. 
So spices are interesting. Uh, we're not talking about salt now and stuff, but um, some people, there's differences in, different people have different preferences for some salt. And my wife, for example, Dr. Miranda likes to have more uh, spicier, you know, herbal things. I happen to be on the other extreme, where I like just eating some skinny vegetables and broccoli, and I'm fine. Um, the one downside to getting too carried away with the spices is they are very stimulating. And so they sometimes will lead people to eat more than they would eat if they were just eating to their normal satiety. So if you find that, if you eat rice, you eat a certain amount. If you spice it up and you end up eating more than that, that may not be a highly desirable thing. So for people trying to do weight reduction, sometimes keeping the spices mild may be helpful. For people that don't, that's not an issue, and they enjoy the spices, I don't see that as a big problem for most people. Some people are very sensitive digestively, they just don't tolerate, you know, they have to keep their uh, meals very simple, they have to minimize some of that. Other people who are more flexible may not be a big issue. But other than perhaps a little overstimulation of the apostatic mechanism, I don't see a huge problem for most people for including, you know, the mild herbs and spices. If you get into the, the, the more irritating stuff, the, the stronger stuff, sometimes that would cause some gastric irritation. How concerning is the increased information about arsenic in rice? So, uh, rice is an interesting, the question is what about arsenic in rice? Um, rice, because of the way it's grown in large amounts of water, will tend to absorb any minerals from the soil more efficiently than perhaps other plants will. So, if you grow rice that's been used, say, to raise cotton, where they use arsenic-based pesticides, the residual arsenic-based pesticides from having grown, say, cotton on that land may come up, and then you can get higher concentrations of arsenic in the, in the rice. One answer would be uh, you can purchase rice from land that hasn't had a, a cotton grown on it, so you can buy California rice from some of the organic growers and, California, and their arsenic levels do tend to be much lower. There's a little bit of arsenic, a little bit of heavy metals in just about everything. There's a certain natural background in some of these minerals. There's some debate about at what level it does it actually affect biological uh, function. The other thing you can do is if you cook rice like you do pasta with large amounts of water, five to one instead of one to one, the net effect is to reduce the arsenic concentration. It also reduces some of your other mineral concentration, but that would be another way of including rice in the diet without a concern, either how you cook it or preferably getting rice that's going to naturally be lower in our The other thing, though, is the people that really should be concerned about these types of concentration are not the vegans that are eating rice and, and vegetables. It's people that are eating animal foods. Because animal foods biologically concentrate the substances from the environment. So a calorie of animal food could have anywhere from two to a thousand times the concentration of various toxic substances compared to plant-based foods. Not that plants can't also have their share of exposure, but I would suggest that biologically it's the people that should be most concerned about these are actually the people that are eating animal-based products and oils and other uh, hyper-concentrated versions of these food sets. So I enjoy organically grown brown rice and I'll continue to incorporate that into my diet. Yes? What about, you know, it's true that most of our patients are motivated by pain, debility, and fear of death. So, you know, that's good motivators. When people are in agonizing pain, they don't want to die, and they've got serious illnesses, and they're just good, it's helpless, and hopeless, and nothing can be done. And that's why they say it should be True North Health Center, the last resort. <laughs> I always wanted to get one of those signs from the Environmental Protection Agency said, True North Health Center, toxic waste dump. <laughs> they said the name was my complaint. I believe that we'll find out that the people that get the greatest benefit from fasting are actually the healthy people who are using it proactively and preventively to keep their systems aligned and balanced. And so I know I fast every year. Uh, I don't like having to take time off and rest and do all the stuff that Dr. 
uh, Asa said, you know, just for me, because it, it is, you know, it is a problem t pulling yourself out of your life and stuff. But I do it every year because I believe that it is an important tool for health promotion. Now, we'll know a little bit more soon because we're involved in doing research we're looking specifically at these biomarker changes. We may be able to start differentiating exactly what benefits are being derived in who and what durations and all that type of stuff uh, that nobody really knows right now because that data, that research hasn't been done. Uh, but I think we're going to find that that may be where some of the biggest benefit comes is in people who are using fasting preventively. I know in my own life, I've been fortunate because I got started here when I was 16 years old, having I mean, my conferences. So I've never smoked a cigarette, never had a cup of coffee, never had a drink, did, never used drugs. You know, have been fortunate to be on a vegan SOS free diet uh, from teenage years. Uh, and yet I still find the fasting, uh, that, that week or two that, that happens once a year, is amongst the more profound things that I've had in my own life. So, you know, I'm a believer, but the data's not in yet, but keep watching as well, we'll have it soon enough. Uh, yeah, so multiple sclerosis is a condition that involves demyelination processes of the nerves, and it's a progressive, debilitating, devastating disease. However, there is evidence from Dr. Swank that's pretty good, pretty compelling, that if you are willing to do dangerous and radical things like eat healthfully, that you can slow down the rate of progression and do well. And our experience with patients has been um, good. I've got many patients now that are you know, three decades in and continue to do well despite the fact that they've had devastating consequences earlier in their life uh, with MS. So a lot we don't know about MS, but um, I think that a health promoting diet and lifestyle is probably the best chance we have to make that not a limiting factor. What about fasting? With fasting, we use fasting rather conservatively with MS patients. It tends to be shorter fasts rather than longer fasts. Because patients with MS, if you get them too weak, it takes them a long time to recover. So we tend to be a little bit conservative. It's not doing the 30, 40 day fast, it's the one to two week fast, typically. Now again, a lot of this is individual variation depending on the patient and their condition. But the general rule of thumb with, with neurologically mediated conditions, we tend to be a little bit conservative and, and, and try not to get too carried away. Question, how long do you keep the medical record about a patient? Forever. Yeah, so we're, we're essentially a human subjects laboratory. So we look like we're a health clinic. But really, this entire process at Human Health Center was designed because really, we, what we most places, what they do is they form a nonprofit, they try to raise money, and then they try to do research. What we did is we, we started the other way. We created the laboratory, we created a financial base, we got the staff together. Then we founded two years ago the nonprofit to actually carry the research for it. And the foundation is largely financed both by our generous donation of our patients and also by any proceeds from the Truman Health Center flow to the Truman Health Foundation. And that's where our major funding comes from, is any residual monies that the Truman Health Center earns fund the Truman Health Foundation operation. So now we're in a position where we're not dependent on having to get some idiot to approve a research grant. We don't have to be dependent on some institution to think that what we're doing is a good thing or not. We have relatively self-contained, self-controlled clinical research facility, and but we're, we are able to now begin publishing major impact peer review journals. And so I think it's been a really long, slow process, but we're finally now seeing some of the fruits of the last three decades of efforts. And I, you'll, we'll see those results, I think, happen geometrically now to begin to work out these affiliations with, with our other facilities. Yeah, you know, it's one of the challenges is intervening with people at various stages in their disease progression. We don't typically see people at the place where you get probably the biggest bang for your intervention, which is before the problems begin, because most people are motivated by pain, debility, and fear of death. So usually you see people kind of at the end stage, you know, here are some reports uh, tomorrow uh, that I think will be revealing on the past. I think we've used our time. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you tomorrow.